Hello everybody. Uh, so today's lecture is on fire and animal interactions. And then once we're done with this lecture, we finished the, the fire ecology section of our class. And now we're going to go into specific regions in California and then talk about their fire history and their adaptations to fire and their fire ecology within specific regions after this lecture. But this one, we're going to focus on how fire affects animals and more, um, more to the point, we're going to focus on how fire affects the habitat in which the animals live. Um, as you can see here, the fire here doesn't really affect this alligator all that much, but this is that habitat that the alligator lives in. So how is this going to change the alligator in terms of food, um, shelter, um, season in terms of um, breeding and all those sorts of things that are important to animals. So that's what we're going to talk about. All right, so let's talk about uh, direct fire effects first off. Obviously, the idea of if it's a huge, fast-moving fire, nothing can be done for the animal um, could result in fatality. Um, but then you also get, uh, in terms of direct effects, you can also get changes in physiology and behavior. So in terms of what the fire does um, to the animal in terms of uh, if, if you get a lot of fires in a row or it changes the, um, the availability of the food for the animal. So the, the animal has to extend its home range or move to another area or um, has to hunt at night instead of during the daytime because it's used to um, being undercover, but now it's all open area. So now all of a sudden, because it's open and it would be exposed, it's got to hunt at a different part of the daytime for its food. It's those sorts of ideas when we say changes in physiology and behavior. And then also the same idea there with displacements in populations and communities. The idea that if their food source is no longer available, they're going to have to go somewhere else. If their um, place that they would um, raise their young isn't there, they're going to have to go somewhere else. And maybe they come back or maybe they find somewhere that they like better or suits them better and then that animal has has changed its pattern so those are those are more of the the specific direct effects that we can get in fire a lot more um, of the negative effects of fire in terms of direct fire effects so before we talked about the idea of um, of the uh, our, our categories of attributes of fire when we think about fire regime. So let's think about um, the effect of fire on animals in our three big categories, our temporal, spatial, and magnitude. So we'll start off with thinking about temporal. So time-wise, how does fire affect animals? The biggest one, it, the biggest attribute category for that would be seasonality because animals are very specific in terms of what time of year they want to be doing certain things. So they they do nesting at a certain time, they do mating at a certain time, they raise their young or they, they brood their young at a certain time, they forage um, during a certain part of the day or night or certain seasons. And then um, for some animals, they go dormant and they hibernate um, at a certain part of the season. And um, those time periods have adapted with fire, at least for animals um, here in the West who have who lived in fire adapted communities for hundreds and hundreds of years. So um, uh, the historic fire season here in California happens after breeding and rearing of the young. And there, to me, that is not an accident. And it's not, it's like, oh, well, good thing that the fires um, happen right after all the young are, are ready to go. It's not really an accident. It's that the animals have adapted their behavior to make sure that they are done with the with their um, breeding and rearing by the time that the fires come about so that they they ha their young have a chance to survive now what happens though is now that we get these changes in the fire pattern into the fire regime now we get earlier fires or fire season starts becoming longer or we get infrequent fires now how does that affect uh, how does that affect the animal population how does that change their dynamics will these animals adapt to a different um, a different way of doing things more than likely the answer is yes but how long is it going to take for that adaptation to occur and how might the population struggle these are all interesting questions to kind of ask ourselves as we uh, 
um, start thinking about the idea that, that we have these changing fire regimes. Let me slide myself over here. Aha! So in terms of spatial attributes uh, for fire, the, the biggest one is spatial complexity. And I tried to put this picture up here to kind of give you that idea. Because with the spatial complexity, we're really talking about that variation within a fire or within a fire regime, right? You can have, in terms of variation within a fire, that's what we're seeing in this picture, right? You get little islands where things survived. You get parts where everything burned down. You get some stuff that's going to come back quickly, like grasses and forbs and things like that. And you got trees, which are going to take 10, 20 years um, to recover. And so it's you're, you're going to get a lot of complexity within a fire and you're also going to get a lot of complexity within the fire regime as well because sometimes you might get big huge stand replacing fires sometimes you might just get a little fire sometimes you might get a fire that burns just a tiny tiny piece of the forest sometimes you get a fire that burns the whole forest um then there's all sorts of other things that could happen um that you know the fire brings in, in an insect infestation or the fire, um, you know, causes causes damage or leads to erosion and flooding. And so there's all sorts of complexity and variation that can come with a fire and a fire regime. And that, that, um, that um, complexity and that variation within the fires and the fire regime leads to a complex and varied vegetation mosaic, which means there's going to be varied food, varied roost, varied nesting sites, very materials available, very um, areas available for cover. And so it's going to change the way that the animals um, um, live. And they're going to have to adapt. And um, it might lead to competition because some, some uh, niches might be, uh, might be uh, tested. Like, for instance, um, say you're like a small rodent and you, you hunt um, for your food during the day because... There's a lot of cover and, you know, the owls and whatever else can't, and eagles and hawks and stuff can't see you. But now if the fire wipes all that out, maybe now you have to hunt at night. Well, maybe when you're hunting at night now, there's also some other rodent that was hunting at night. And now both of you are hunting at night, which means now you gotta, you gotta compete. And we know if two, two animals are trying to compete for the same niche, one of them's gonna win, one of them's gonna lose. And so one of them is either going to have to move on or find a new food or they're going to die out in the competition. And so it it just, fire will change things. Now these animals have adapted to it. So most of them probably have a backup plan or just know how to move on to something else if the fire regime is consistent, if it's something that they're, that they're used to ha having happen. But if it's like a once in a lifetime sort of thing, or you know, every hundred years this happens, it might completely change the way that the animal goes about its business. And how significant that change is, is going to vary with the size and the scale of the patches. If these patches, you know, if there's an, it, and it depends on the, the size of the animal, right? If this, if we're looking at something like this, and you're, um, you know, a fly or a little, a um, mouse or something like this, maybe this picture on the left here, maybe that's not a big deal for you. Maybe you got still have plenty of cover and all of that, right? But if you're, say, a moose or something like that, you're going to have to move on if you're trying to find some grass and and cover and things like that that you might be looking for. So it it's not only the size of the fire that, that this is going to, the significance of the fire, will vary with but also the size of the animal and what the animal needs in terms of its home range and its um, food supply and and all of that so it's it's a very complicated idea in terms of how the spatial complexity of a fire or a fire regime can affect uh, its its interactions with animals in terms of our magnitude uh, attributes there's two of them that we really kind of focus on the idea of intensity and the idea of severity so with intensity that's the one that's responsible for most direct injury or fatality to wildlife you get temperatures above basically above 100 degrees are going to be lethal to most animals um, there's a temperature range there because some animals can handle heat more than others 
Um, and uh, if you got a burrowing animal to get underground, they're they're all right. But if you're stuck on land, um, that's the temperature that you can handle. And so if you get a really intense fire, really you know hot fire, that's the one that's going to be causing the most direct injury or the or fatality. Fire severity is indicative of the degree of, degree of uh, habitat alteration. So we can see right here in this picture on the left, pretty um, severe fire. And the reason we can say severe fire is, well, how much did it uh, alter the habitat? Well, you can see all of the trees are burnt. You can see there's no shrubbery. You can see there's not really much grass. It should look, you know, something like this maybe up here, but we're seeing there's nothing of that down there, which means that's that's a pretty severe habitat alteration. And so that's the type of thing in terms of severity that we're looking for. How altered is the habitat? How much are these animals going to have to change the way they do things? Is it going to be all the animals having to change the way that they do it? Or is it only going to be some of the animals? And something like this, so pretty severe. The, the animals who live in here are probably going to have to figure out something else to do. go. So in terms of indirect effects, which is what we're really going to focus on, because like, like I said, direct, when we're talking about direct effects, we're really focused on um, really two ideas, either injury or fatality, and then really the other idea being um, the, the changes in behavior um, or the displacement where they, they have to move to somewhat, somewhere else. In terms of the indirect effects, we're really it's a lot of focus on the environment, the, the biotic and the abiotic factors of the environment. And then the, the time period um, uh, along with that change, because you can get um, some changes um, depending on maybe like what, what species of vegetation you're in. So say you're in a grassland, it might only be, you know, a couple of years or a few months to have it get back to the way things were. Um, whereas if it's a forest and it's a stand replacing event, it might take 20, 30 years before everything is back to normal, which for some species, that's a whole lifetime or that's a whole couple of lifetimes for some species of animals. And so it's really, there's a lot of different um, ways to look at it in terms of these indirect effects when we talk about um, the biotic and abiotic factors. So uh, in terms of fire, when we're talking about indirect effects of fire uh, on animals, fire can alter the structure and the composition of vegetation. So when we say the structure of composi and composition, the structure, um, how much of it is there, how big, how tall it is, right? If we've got tall grass or trees and then now all of a sudden everything's burned down, well, now all we have is, is bare soil, right? And the comp composition of vegetation. So... Um, you can have it to where, you know, you have a lot of fires in a row and maybe a shrubland um, all of a sudden becomes a grassland. Or maybe um, you have a lot of invasive species on, on your property and invasive species like the disturbance of fire, whereas the native vegetation doesn't like the disturbance of fire. So you end up getting more of these invasive species or vice versa. Maybe you're in an area where the native species really need fire and the invasive species don't like it although it's hard with invasive species are pretty much adapted to this disturbance that's why they become invasive species but maybe doing fire will will give the native vegetation just as much of um, a boost in competition as you could give the um, the uh, non-native invasive species um, fire can temporarily or permanently reduce some food types while increasing others um, the example would be, um, say you have something like an oak woodland. The fire goes and burns up the oak trees, right? So maybe all the oak uh, acorns aren't going to be around for a few years, probably like a decade or so before they start coming back. Whereas though maybe there's a bunch of seed um, that ends up in the ground. So there's a, a big increase in seed or um, the nutrient content from the ash from the fire getting into the ground, now brings up all sorts of other um, different grasses and different forbs and things that were have been in the soil but um, haven't gotten 
enough um, nutrition to, to come out of the soil. Maybe now they come out of the soil. So you can increase some food types while also decreasing others. And it, it really varies with um, what kind of fire you had, what kind of animals are in that area, what kind of vegetation and species you have in that area, all sorts of ways that that can vary. Um, fire can also open up uh, areas that were previously closed by vegetation. So uh, opening up um, holes in the canopy provides light onto the ground, lets things grow up. Um, can um, also just areas that were thick with vegetation maybe open it up so now maybe um, it can work both ways where there's a lot of animals that were maybe hiding and, and sleeping in those areas. Now they've got to find some other area to do that in. Whereas it might also open up um, corridors or pathways where other animals couldn't get in and now they can get in. So there's all sorts of different ways to look at it. And really the final answer to this is going to be there are positive effects for some animals, there are negative effects for some animals, or there are positive effects for a time period for some animals and there are negative effects for a time period for some animals. But let's, let's focus a little bit more. So let's talk about habitat structure specifically. So fire, in terms of habitat structure, can alter individual plants. It can get rid of some plants. It could um, favor some plants over other plants. It could um, limit the size of some plants. Like if you get fire over and over again, maybe the plant um, should get to 15 feet tall, but now it's only getting to 8 feet tall because it knows that it's not going to spend that much energy because it's going to get burned over again. It can affect the density of the vegetation by thinning it out, um, getting rid of some stuff. It can change the age class distribution of plant species. So say you have an older area because you hadn't had a fire for a while, but now you start getting fires every five years. Well, now all of a sudden you're going to end up, instead of having more of a mature or maybe even an old growth uh, type of a setting, now you're going to be knocked all the way back to more early stages to where you're getting a lot of species and younger species and a lot and a lot more of these kind of um, early serial stage species. It can affect the three-dimensional structure of the habitat and um, I would say think about the vertical structure, right? So, um, you know, maybe it's a forest but you get a stand replacing fire so maybe now what you really have is you've got a bunch of grass and some shrubs and a bunch of snags and you really don't have those trees growing yet until you get 20 30 years down the line and then of course then that get, ties into the idea of fire altering the composition of plant species because really if you have a bunch of standing snags you don't really have like let's call it a lodgepole pine forest anymore you really have a um, you know maybe a uh, a like a shrubland, a grassland shrubland area that eventually becomes a woodland and eventually works its way back into a lodgepole pine forest, but it might be 30, 40, 50 years down the road before you really feel like you're back into that lodgepole pine forest again. Um, after fire comes through, you're going to have a shift in available habitat and in habitat quality. It might be short-lived, and if we're in smaller vegetation, grassland, shrubland, more than likely it's going to be uh, more short-lived because it takes less energy to grow those things again but it could be decades to centuries in larger vegetation and that's why people make a big deal about uh, huge forest fires because that's when it's a, such a large area it's a really big deal to the the local the local um, fauna because it's hard for the animals to adjust if they've got to go find you know it it really comes down to an understanding of home range. And when we talk about an animal's home range, we talk about the idea of how far it goes on like a daily basis to meet its needs. And so if an animal's home range is um, totally within this forest and then the whole forest burns down, now it's got to expand its home range way beyond what it's ever been before. And if that's, you know, next to a city or something like that, maybe there's not resources available and then what happens to that animal it's got to just figure it out right because that's the that's competition adapt or 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 perish and so those are the types of things where it really becomes interesting if it's if it's small vegetation where it can come back quickly uh, this shift might just be short-lived might might just be temporary 
but if it's a decades or centuries long shift and you're an animal that only lives 10 years, that's your whole lifetime. And you've got to figure out and change your whole life, basically. And so it, it becomes pretty difficult for some animals. And for some animals, it's not a big deal at all. You know, if you're a coyote or something like that, where your home range, you can, or a wolf, you're, you know, you can go all over the place. And your, you know, your native habitat is the western United States. It's really easy for you to move on to the next area. But, you know, for some places like, um, let's pick something specific, like prairie chickens in um, Texas. Um, with something like a prairie chicken, your, your home range is only, you know, a few hundred yards sort of a thing is how far you go um, to, to meet your daily requirements. And if all of that burns up, you gotta, you got to move on to a whole new area and figure, figure it all out again. So it, it's just interesting when you really think about it. And, you know, if you're sitting there going, well, there's so many different animals and there's so many different ways. Yeah, absolutely. That's, that's the thing. It's hard to really quantify something like this. And then the other thing that just makes it hard to quantify any of this is the idea that animals to, to be able to watch what they do and to be able to, to see them and track them and all is very hard. So it's all, it's a little bit of this is, um, just, it's like, why would we focus on the indirect effect on animals? Because animals are really hard to, to track and to, to get to know really well and to, to, uh, learn about, you know, I, I can do a study on trees and I can, you know, go look at hundreds or thousands of trees and figure this out because trees don't move. But animals are constantly moving. You know, I might I might go do a study on something like kit foxes, and maybe I've only got like 20 kit foxes in the whole study, right? And that's a huge difference between like this study with 500 trees and this study with 20 kit foxes. But you know, maybe a study with 20 kit foxes is a lot of kit foxes because it's hard to find animals. And it's hard to track them. So that becomes um, another reason why indirect effects are so much easier to kind of quantify. So let's talk about snags, because snags are extremely beneficial to wildlife. And a snag is just a standing dead tree, as you can see in this picture with these, uh, with these uh, raccoons here on the right. They're very beneficial to many species of wildlife. Uh, fire can both uh, increase, create more snags, and decrease, uh, burn down the snags that were there. Um, also in terms of downed wood, right? Because if the fire burns the snag down, well, now we've increased the downed wood on the ground, but fire might have also come through and burned off the downed wood on the ground. So it's kind of, it's another one of those positives and negatives with fire. Um, how are snags beneficial to wildlife? It comes down to them providing food, uh, shelter, and nesting. And so if you check, check out these pictures here, see these owls, the woodpecker, even this bear in here, um, snags are very beneficial for wildlife. Let me slide myself over here. There we go. So I've got this, the wonderful life of a dead tree, or what I would like to say, call it more as a snag because that this is a standing dead tree. So it shows the woodpecker chopping into the tree to feed on beetle larvae, and the only reason the beetles are there is because this is a dead tree. So we were talking about the idea of it being um, providing a source of food. So the this tree gets burnt up by the fire. The beetles um, have this sense and they go, hey, there's a damaged tree over there. That's a tree we can go and we can eat up all the, the cambium in the tree. So they move over to this tree. And then the woodpecker goes, ooh, this tree is full of beetles. I'm going to have a field day. So there's there's our food source, right? And then um, you can have these cavities in the trees that become roosts or homes for the animals. So this guy right here is hanging out here, and he's got a nice little new home. And um, these birds over here, they are going to modify, make some little holes to their size, so they have their own little, little cavities. This uh, owl here might be uh, using it as just shelter to get away from the, uh, the elements, you know being out in the rain or out in the sun or having just a little resting place or um, sometimes rodents will um, 
make little nests up in the trees because uh, you might have snakes or other predators that can't make it, you know, maybe that snake can climb up to here but can't climb all the way up to here. So maybe you got a squirrel or something that's going to make its little home up here so that it doesn't have to um, compete and it can have a little bit of shelter. Um, so these are all these are pretty pretty important benefits for wildlife and so wildlife enjoy the idea of snags and having um, snags available to them. There are also some um, what the book calls microhabitat elements things that I'm just kind of used to in terms of um, being on a fire and seeing them on a fire. Uh, so the first one that talks about is cat faces. Now a cat face, if you're not comfortable with that, that's what this thing is right here on the right. It's a deeply burned section of the bowl, which makes the tree vulnerable, but also then once again does um, the same thing as snags. Now the reason this isn't called a snag is because this tree might be alive. Even though it's got this big huge cat face here, that tree might be alive, but still provides those same um, same qualities, the food, the food, a roosting and, and shelter that a snag does. Uh, you might get scorching and scarring on the trees that they might, that might kill the tree or induce some physiological stress, like, um, like bring in, um, bring in the bark beetles, which will then attack the tree. And, you know, maybe you only use, lose part of the tree. Maybe you lose the whole tree. Um, depends on how much scorching and what kind of species of tree and um, how the residence time, lots of different things. And then, you know, what happens after that in terms of insects or fungus or whatever else might attack the tree. And then you can also have hollow trees, which are very similar to the idea of a snag and very similar to the idea of a cat face. A cat face, you just get this kind of hole here down at the bottom of the bowl but a hollow tree would then be this hole and it would kind of continue on up the tree for a little bit you could still have the tree be alive because maybe um, up in the uh, canopy you're not having any problems but you might have some problems lower in the bowl but once again shelter nests food and so here's just some examples of those things let me move myself down here out of the way kind of similar idea so, um, you know, you've got beneath the bark, you might have some insects, you might have a, a woodpeckers, squirrels, those sorts of things living there. You know, you still got the animals up above using it. And these guys, you know, they're perfectly fine. And this tree's alive and, and still working, but there might be other things going on um, in this tree. Like this bear right here, he's enjoying himself. Or this, what I believe is a porcupine. Looks like a porcupine to me. Got this nice, um, found this nice um, little uh, area within a tree, to, a hollow tree to hang out. So still, still useful for animals. The tree can be alive instead of dead. Serves the same purpose as the snags. So in terms of sticking with our idea of um, indirect effects in terms of plant density and size so fire can alter the configuration and degree of canopy closure so the idea of how the canopy looks the fire can make it a smaller canopy um, we've talked about how trees will self prune um, with age to try and get away from fires but maybe the fires will um, will also prune the trees up a little bit so it might make the the canopy a little bit smaller and it, a fire can, you know, through scorching and scarring and that sort of thing, maybe burn off a few branches here or some needles here and can really open up the uh, canopy, you know, get rid of a few trees here or there, create some gaps and some pa some patches and let a lot of light on the ground. It can really change things. So then it says fire can alter the juxtaposition and density of plants. Well, now um, in terms of juxtaposition, what's next to each other so you know it might have been a whole stand of ponderosa pine trees but now there's some gaps created so now maybe there's some shrubs next to the ponderosa pine and there's a a grassland or now a little valley kind of forming next to or in between some of these ponderosa pines so it can it can change what's next to each other but then also the density of the plants because we have less ponderosa pine but now we have more grass and and vice versa and things like that 
So there's all sorts of different ways to look at it. Uh, the big thing for me is fire, um, opening up these gaps, um, opening the canopy, and then exposing the forest floor to light and, um, and allowing these other species to flourish and giving us that real mosaic kind of a look in terms of, of these areas. It's always, it's the same thing we've been talking about, beneficial for some species, detrimental to other. And it's really focused on the two ideas, the idea of open habitat and what species um, thrives in open habitat, what species um, does open habitat not work for. Like for instance, if you're a small prey, like a mouse or something that's used to being hidden, might not work as well for you. If you're an owl who, you know, has to search through and, you know, though you see a glimpse and then go for it, uh, you know, it used to be a lot harder, but now all of a sudden it's open and it might be a field day of, there's a mouse, there's a mouse, there's a mouse, there's a mouse, and, and that owl is just picking off targets left and right. So but beneficial to some, detrimental to others. Um, with edge, that's something we're going to focus on in a little bit, but species like deer love edge because they love the species that come up in the edge, and they love having the the um, the early stage successional species because a lot of that stuff is a little more nutritious and softer and kind of a little more... Um, what we would probably consider, uh, if it was like human food, there'd be a little more candy along the edge where you, you got a little more of your, your fibrous and not so tasty stuff, uh, back in the, the middle of the dense forest. Um, one thing that can be huge in terms of plant density and size is losing large trees because it can be really crucial to some species. So some of the bigger ideas in terms of why large trees and losing large trees is so important is that large animals can't fit into small trees. So if you've got um, some of the bigger birds like owls and things like that, if uh, if you burn up all the big trees and all you've got left are, you know, uh, little tiny trees, right? Little saplings and, and, and just little seedlings and then saplings and all that, if you've got a bird that's, you know, this big, it's not going to fit in there, and it can't. Or you've got, like, a vulture or something that likes to roost on tall trees. If, if there's no tall trees anymore, there's nothing that they can really do about that. So large animals, you know, a raccoon, if I've got just nothing but a, a floor of seedlings this big, a raccoon cannot fit into that and it's going to have to find somewhere else to to make its little its little roosting spot um, smaller animals prefer large trees to avoid predators so we talked about the idea of like you know um, a squirrel or something being up in the tree to avoid snakes and um, and um, other predators like that if you have nothing but small trees now all of a sudden maybe that predator can can make it up or you have to find somewhere else um, the animal has to figure out some other thing other than just I'm going to run up the tree and get away from this animal. So that's one thing you want to think about uh, as well. Um, the third kind of bigger uh, point in terms of this loss of large trees is that large trees provide more opportunity for food and habitat. So we talked about how many animals um, were using the trees for, for shelter and for food. Um, and it's not just, so when we talked about snags, it's, oh, like the birds can get there because there's more um, beetles available. But if we're just talking about like um, trees in general, like large trees, if you've got, you know, um, a large oak tree, it's dropping acorns that the deer are eating those acorns, maybe elk, maybe moose, whatever species you have um, in your area. But if those trees are gone, now that food source is gone and those animals have to go find food somewhere else and so it's it's when you lose large trees you know if you think about your older um your older trees versus your younger trees one of the big deal is um like on on younger trees younger smaller trees they do provide a food source as well like deer love eating little little trees because the meat the leaves are nutritious especially like little broad leaf um, seedlings when they're young but when they're older, you know, maybe that those trees are turning into an, an oak or some other tree that, that provides a, uh, or some of the other broadleaf trees with their, with their fruits and provide, um, 
the uh, berries and things like that that squirrels or um, birds or any other small rodent sort of a thing um, can use as a food source. And so that lack of a food source and that lack of habitat um, and then just even the idea of big trees provide a lot of shade and, you know, can give give animals that, that cover, that shelter feeling and not having that anymore can be, can be a huge deal. So still can be beneficial in some ways, detrimental in others. But the loss of large trees as opposed to small trees is a really big deal. So here's just kind of talking about uh, putting that idea together too. So here's, you know, this tree's alive, this one's dead, um, this one's dead, we got a gap here. You know, how does this affect the animals in the area? Well, you know, this oak tree right here, this pine tree, you know, maybe some squirrels were eating the, the seeds out of the pine cone sort of a thing, so the squirrel's still happy. But the deer or the elk um, in this area that were coming around eating the acorns, well, now they've got to go somewhere else because maybe the oak trees here and here, and um, they're not, they don't have that food source anymore. So they've got to go somewhere else and find find that food source. Well, if you're, you know, if they go to some other area, how far are they going to go? And when is this oak tree going to start producing? And are the deer going to come back by that point? Or if they're gone for, you know, five years or, or um, 10 years or something like that, are the deer just never going to come back to this area or maybe it'll have to be until the next area gets burned and then maybe they come back sort of a thing and so it's it's the it's a dynamic it's a constantly shifting thing that you just kind of um you know these animals are adjusted to it and adapted to it because it's been happening for um hundreds of years but uh it depends on you know the size of the property that you manage and that sort of thing. If I'm looking at it like I manage the Sierra National Forest, maybe not a big deal because they just move off of this patch to the next patch. But if I'm somebody who likes having um, deer around or somebody who has like a hunting lease on my land and I get a fire, well, maybe I can't sell hunting leases now for the next, you know, 10 years or so. And then I'm hoping I can sell hunting leases again, or maybe I don't ever get to sell hunting leases on my land again. So there's all sorts of different ways to, to think about um, not only just the interactions between the fire and the animals, but then how does that affect us in our management of these areas. In terms of soil and litter, um, the fire can both consume and provide the litter and duff layer. So if you have a litter and duff layer fire comes through, it'll eat all that stuff up because that stuff's ready to burn. But then at the same time, it's also going to burn up a bunch of stuff, drop ash onto the ground, and that becomes the next um, the next uh, litter and duff layer or the beginning of that next litter and duff layer. Um, and then it also, what we've talked about before, can open up um, the ground, which can then open habitat for seeds. And that's going to produce um, lots of little seedlings like this, which, like I've said before, there's some species like deer that really love uh, little seedlings like this. Um, it's also just the animals that eat seeds. So um, like squirrels, things like that, that that can go and eat seeds. Now all of a sudden if the ground's just open, there's a bunch of seeds everywhere. It's like a, it's like a buffet for squirrels and they can, you know, it's just like, ooh, look at all these seeds sitting there. In terms of habitat distribution, this kind of gets back into our spatial complexity idea. Um, so the spatial relationship of patches, post-fire is important. So in terms of patches, the number and sizes of patches, the juxtaposition of suitable habitat, and the connectivity between patches. And so I picked this picture right here because um, I think it, it does a good idea of this idea of spatial relationships. So in terms of the number of patches, you can see, and the size of patches, you can see there's um, there was a lot of burn happening here. And you can see there's some patches here, which I would say, oh, well, those are probably drainages that have water. And that's why those areas didn't burn as opposed to the other areas. So in terms of number and sizes of patches, we got a lot of different patches going on in this area. But we do have some big patches, 
and some um, you know medium patches and some really small patches so we've got a lot of different size patches which means this area will probably still work um, for wildlife quite a bit the juxtaposition of the suitable habitat right is it just hugely burned area next to hugely burned area next to hugely burned area well no we've got like a burned area but then we've got a little bit of habitat burned area a little bit of habitat burned area good amount of habitat burned area you know good amount of habitat so it's not just like this is all burned or some of this is burned and some of this isn't we've got a little mixture of both happening and then connectivity between the habitat patches well because we have what to me is an obvious waterway here because we've got the drainages going down that didn't burn and then this area that didn't burn as well we've got water we've got cover we've got connection between some of these patches to where they don't have to just run out in the open so it's this area would still work greatly for wildlife now um, i say that um, it'll work it depends on the size of the animal and and the home range because if it's an animal where its whole home range was just that area right there well then that animal is going to have to change and adapt and move somewhere else that might work for them whereas if it's a like let's say a coyote or deer and that's its home range well then there's still um, parts of their home range that didn't burn down and they'll they'll still be fine and still be able to just um, move around to a little bit different parts of their home range, but it de it's a very much an it depends sort of thing on the size of the animal and the size of its home range. Um, you can get some plant type conversions, right? Um, so if this area here continues to burn, maybe instead of being a forest, it becomes a valley. Um, well, I mean, it's a little too hilly to be a valley but just an open grassland on this hill on this uh, mountainside as opposed to being um, a forest cover uh, and then edge effect and so with edge effect um, I've got this link here to a, a forest service document you, you can pause the video click on that link to check out that forest uh, service document uh, and uh, talk about edge effect and then if you pause the video again or you know just go and check this other link as well this is links to a YouTube video where uh, I've got a uh, a guy explaining um, the idea of edge effect and what is good edge versus um, not good edge in terms of wildlife so you can go ahead and pause and then so what is the edge effect in terms of edge effect it's really the idea of creating um a, a layer of mosaic to where you get um when we say mosaic before we're kind of talking about like this area is burned this area is not burned um, but we're, what we're really getting at when we're talking about patches and gaps and edge effect is the idea that we have vegetation in these different serial stages so you've got some early serial stage stuff you got some grasses and forbs and herbs and you got some middle um, cereal stage stuff there's some grass there's some shrubs there's some small trees you got some mature stuff so i still got some big trees and mature forest and so what's nice for um, some animals is you get different things in the different spots so a deer an elk which is what we see in the pictures here nice white-tailed deer and a, and a roosevelt elk in this picture and what you can get in these areas is that some of this stuff works for them in terms of their feeding some of this works for them in terms of their um, of their um, nesting or their laying uh, area that they use for for home or for shelter right in terms of this deer if this deer doesn't want to be um, captured by prey or you know um, shot by a hunter that sort of a thing being out here in the grassland is not great right if it hears a sound that it doesn't like it's going to run off and and be hidden in the woods however in terms of feeding all this stuff all these little early early cereal stage food things like that this deer loves it this deer you know if you uh for me the experience is driving um driving at night down a highway in alabama uh, 
and just looking out and seeing like what seemed like hundreds of deer, some of them in the middle island of the freeway and some of them right off to the side of the freeway, but just eating and um, just enjoying all that food because that stuff's always constantly mowed. So there's always this constant edge effect of there's the forest off in the distance, but right next to the freeway, they've got all the early cereal stage stuff. And that stuff is, it's softer. Um, it's got um, maybe um, sometimes a little more nutritional value. So the animals love eating there, but still need the forest, still need that other area for cover and for um for um, its home, for laying down, for raising the young sort of a thing. But the edge effect provides them kind of the best of both worlds where they can go somewhere to get this, but then they also can go somewhere else to get that. And so for the deer, it's really the idea of the, the foraging area versus the shelter area. In terms of food availability, um, which I think it's kind of crucial for animals. Fire can alter the types of food that's available, the quantity, and the nutritional value of the plant matter. And when we say the plant matter, we mean um, the foliage, the fruits, and the nuts. Uh, fire does this by altering the age class distribution and the species composition of the vegetation community. And we've talked about the idea of the age class um, distribution. It's that same idea of the edge effect, right? We're taking some of the stuff that might have been older and now knocking it back into cereal state. Uh, earlier cereal stages and getting more more grass, more shrubs, more of this younger um, younger type of stuff. So that is the change in the nutritional value, change in the type, and then the quantity, right? Um, if you have an, an oak woodland and you burn up all the oak trees, well, maybe the acorns aren't available, but maybe now there's other seed sources and things like that that come up. So there's going to be some, uh, maybe a lot of um, seeds available now, but less acorns available. And so that's how um, fire can affect the quantity of something. Um, so because of that, whatever happens uh, in terms of fire um, changing the age class distribution and the species composition, that's then going to dictate what happens to the composition and structure of the animal community, because that's going to determine which animals stay, which animals stay and which animals go and which animals are benefited and which ones are, um, it, it's a more detrimental thing to them. It just will depend on the fire and the fires, you know, um, all the different complexities that come within the fire. Some food's going to be greatly increased and it may just be a few years before returning to normal production. And the, the easiest example we give for that one is the, the grasslands versus the shrublands, the grassland, um, grassland might come back in a few months, might come back in a few years. But if it's a shrubland or a forest, it's going to take longer, maybe five years, maybe 10 years, maybe 30, 40, 50 years. And so this is the last idea I'll leave you with in terms of this lecture, which is the idea that the relationship between fire, habitat, alteration, and species and community response is complicated. It just is because there's so much variation and there's just no way to really nail down that variation. So it's due to the spatial and temporal variation within each fire and within the fire regime, the, the series and pattern of fires over and over again, that creates a complex and varied environment for animals. Now, it's gonna be beneficial to some, it's not gonna be beneficial to others. It's going to be beneficial at certain times for some and it's going to be detrimental for certain at certain times for others it just it's your it's your great it depends but that's what makes it interesting that's what makes it worth studying and that's just the idea of we we in the fire ecology community kind of preach the idea of the mosaic of of it's okay for fire to have fire as long as it's not fire that is just burning down everything in sight, right? If there's some areas that are fine, and some areas that are really burnt, and some areas that are only kind of burnt, and some areas that are only a little bit burnt, that mosaic, that is going to be the best result because that's going to work for the most amount of animals, that's going to work for the most amount of vegetation, that's going to work for... 
the most for us in terms of there's still going to be areas where we can do stuff. There's going to be this area where we can't do stuff, but it's not everything is ruined. There's, there's bits and pieces here and there. And so that's, it's, it's complicated, but that's also what makes it interesting in my mind.